My name is David Bishop and today we'll be covering the use of ketamine, uh, which is an immensely useful drug, especially in district hospitals. And this talk's been split into two parts. Uh, the first was done by Dr. Simon Leroux from Global Surgery in Cape Town, and he will be covering the drug actions um, and the setup and the process one should follow when using ketamine and some of the dosing. I'll be dealing with the practical aspects and some of the recipes you can use and I will revise some of the principles mentioned by Simon as we go. Now the first thing to know is that ketamine is not an elegant drug. There will definitely be side effects or um, elements to the anesthetic that are uh, not easily controlled. It's actually a really safe drug, but if you look at what experienced anesthetists do, they really use it as a solo agent. We tend to use it in low doses and for a variety of reasons, such as prevention of hyperalgesia, um, as an analgesic, um, and, and as a complement or a supplement to the anesthetic that we're giving. So when you give it as a solo agent, when you do a pure ketamine anesthetic, what you can expect are hallucinations, cardiovascular changes, such as um, tachycardia and high blood pressures, excessive salivation, and then movement. And when you use ketamine as a pure anesthetic agent, you, you will find it very difficult to get a motionless patient unless you use very high doses or you combine with other agents to smooth out the ketamine anesthetic. And these are just things you must expect. Because it's a dissociative anesthetic, patients look awake, they'll often move, and yet they won't be aware or feeling what you're doing. And so it, it is not an elegant anesthetic that, that you're going to do, but it is a very safe anesthetic to give, especially if you're uh, a junior anesthetist. Now, the first thing that's worth mentioning is that you must think about your context when you're proceeding with ketamine anesthesia or sedation. And that means looking at your environment, the procedure you're doing, the level of training you and your staff have, and the urgency of the procedure. So always think about uh, what am I doing? Where am I doing it? Who am I doing it with? And what is the condition of my patient? And the rules will change depending on where you are. So imagine you're doing a procedure in the ward and something goes wrong. It's difficult to rescue. It's not the same as if, as if you were in theater and you have all your equipment and staff are used to dealing with complication. Secondly, the doses changes, change with the condition of the patient. Very, very sick patients need much less drug than very, very healthy patients. And so you, you can't just use one recipe that you use on everyone. You always have to adjust what you're doing for where you are, what you're doing, uh, and how the patient is. And I've just put this up here just to remind you that sometimes district hospitals can feel like a battlefield. And battlefield anesthetic can, can be just a, an intravenous dose of ketamine, a single intravenous dose, and then you begin. And that's really what they do on battlefields. And sometimes that's what it feels like in a district hospital. But always consider, is that the situation I'm in? And if it's not either got that urgency, you've got a little bit of time, or maybe you've got equipment, then you mustn't treat it as a battlefield. You must now prepare and do it, uh, prepare well and do it better. Is there time to improve? So you must ask that question. And if so, then improve. Don't get into the habit of thinking, oh, well, I did this last time with no monitors or I did it um, and it went fine. Get into the habit of finding monitors and putting them on the patient. Thinking about if it goes wrong, how will I manage that situation? Bring the resuscitation trolley next to the patient. Make sure you've got suction available. Those sorts of things. Don't get into bad habits when there is equipment available. And there often is. There often is that you can use. And if you can, build in a fasting, patient, uh, a fasting period for patients. So give them time uh, before you start the procedure where they haven't eaten. Something like two hours would be nice. With clear fluids and peds, you can, you can go as short as one hour. Uh, the, the official fasting guidelines for adults are that six hours are required after solids. So try and do these procedures after a fast, especially if you're going towards deep sedation or anesthesia, because the airway is not protected with ketamine. And then think about whether the patient is stable and low risk or unstable and high risk. And then you must adjust your recipe. In general, 
you can give multiple drugs and use a complex recipe for stable patients so that it's, an, it's a pleasant experience and a slightly more uh, elegant anesthetic. But if the patient is unstable, you want to keep things as simple as possible, as I'll show you. Now remember that ketamine comes in different strengths, 10 milligrams per mole, 50 milligrams per mole, or 100 milligrams per mole. We have so many drug errors. I just want to make that point, always check which one you've been given. And then we're going to talk about dosing, but and, and Simon went through this, but you don't have to store these in your head. You must just cheat. Get the poster, put it on the wall, and look at it every time you use the drug. This is the Sasa sedation poster. It's got all the drugs. It's an excellent resource. It's freely available. Print this thing out and put it on your wall. And there's the ketamine dosing. Um, we don't have to go through it now, but it's all there. And you can just look when you use the drug. Now for ketamine, these are, the, these are the doses I use. When I'm bolusing, I use a half a milligram per kilogram intravenously, and I just repeat as needed. If I'm giving an infusion, I use two to four milligrams per kilogram per hour. The simple way to do that is draw up a four milligram per mole infusion. So say 200 milligrams in 50 mils, and you run it at the weight of the patient. And that'll give you four milligrams per kilogram per hour. If you're giving intramuscularly, the dose range is 2 to 5 milligrams per kilogram. I tend to use, if it's the first dose, I use 5 milligrams per kilogram IMI. So I'm either choosing intravenous or IM. Often the IM route helps in pediatric patients, as I'll come to. And then for oral dosing, 5 to 10 milligrams per kilogram orally. But usually we give 5 milligrams per kilogram orally, and then we supplement it with other things. If you're going to do a slightly more complex recipe, I give an anti silagogue something to dry up the secretions, and I use glycopyrrolate, about 5 marks per kilogram. Um, the range is actually 3 to 10 marks per kilogram, but if you use a bit of glycopyrrolate or atropine, you will see a tachycardia, but it will also dry the patient up. I give some midazolam routinely. So before I give the ketamine, I give the anti silagogue and I give midazolam something like 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. And in adults, two and a half to five milligrams as a stat dose. And you give these up front before you start thinking about ketamine. And this will just smooth the anesthetic out. It will give some anxiolysis. It will often prevent those hallucinations. And then you add your ketamine to this mixture. And the ketamine is then added at half a milligram per kilogram intravenous doses. So these are the three drugs I routinely use for sedation. And I always use a bit of midazolam and a bit of ketamine if my patient is stable. I've put propofol in brackets there because the even more elegant way to do it is propofol and ketamine. But I think that if you are starting to think about propofol, you must be slightly more experienced as an anesthetist because the level of apnea, the amount of apnea is going to go up significantly. Now, in general, for stable patients, I do a calm anesthetic. <clears throat> I give midazolam and glycopyrrolate first, and then I titrate my ketamine. For unstable patients, and when there's no airway, so you're going to do a ketamine anesthetic with no airway. And this is not advisable, but I know it is done, especially when you haven't got anyone who's able to manage the airway. You give an intravenous bolus and you either repeat the boluses as necessary every five to ten minutes or you run an infusion. And in that setting where ketamine is probably going to increase the blood pressure and cause a tachycardia, any low blood pressure you treat with fluids because it's almost invariably fluids. There are other explanations, but the most common one is fluids, so you just run your fluids in. If you're going to do an unstable patient but you are able to put in an airway, such as an, uh, an endotracheal tube, then use your ketamine one to two milligrams per kilogram as an induction dose. Give succimethonium one milligram per kilogram and intubate the patient. And then maintain the patient with boluses or an infusion and any low blood pressure you treat with fluids. And those are the three basic approaches to recipes. Now, if I were to get a five-year-old who perhaps had a gluteal abscess that we wanted to drain, and um, we weren't able to get IV access as a very as a crying child is in his mother's arms. Uh, what I'll sometimes do is sneak up and give the child an IMI inject injection of five milligrams per kilogram. 
and the mother can just hold the child until you can get the monitors on you can then insert an IVI line and then you titrate uh, intravenously after that I often do still use a bit of midazolam and glycopyrrolate as my first doses and then I follow that up with low doses of ketamine and that's a pretty safe method for doing a reasonably stable pediatric patient in a district hospital. If I was doing an ectopic pregnancy that was unstable and ruptured, I would use that unstable recipe that I've, I've just mentioned to you, ketamine IVI boluses. Uh, remember that for an, uh, an ectopic pregnancy, uh, intubation is still the gold standard, but if you can't do that, uh, a laryngeal mask or an eye gel. Um, and if you can't do that, you still you cannot transfer these patients out of the hospital because they will die on transfer. So if you're unable to insert an airway, then you could do that just under ketamine and treat hypotension with fluids and blood. It's not the recommended way, but it's still better than putting the patient on an ambulance uh, for transfer when they're that unstable. If I was going to do a fracture manipulation uh, in ED or casualty, in a stable adult patient, I would try to fast the patient. I would put an IV line up and I would put monitors on, monitors being an ECG monitor, a BP cuff and a SATS monitor. I would give midazolam, midazolam something like 2.5 to 5 milligrams and then I would titrate in the ketamine half a milligram per kilogram uh, at a time until I get to the level where I can manipulate the fracture. And then I would keep the patient in ED until they'd woken up. And finally, for seizures, we've talked about this in a different lecture. Just remember that you don't have to go straight to ketamine. You can use an opioid like fentanyl. You can use nitrous oxide. You can use paracetamol and anti-inflammatories. And then what I do is I take ketamine half milligram per kilogram boluses. And I, well, that's what I suggest people do. And then they repeat them as necessary. Experienced anesthetists will not use this recipe. They're unlikely to use ketamine this early. Um, but it is not a bad analgesic to use if you're inexperienced and isolated in a district hospital. <laughs> Just a word on burns, dressing changes. Ketamine is very, very useful. Um, probably the best recipes that I've seen were developed by Dr. Nikki Alorto, who's the president of the South African Burn Society um, and, uh, and is uh, one of the leading voices in, in, in burns therapy in, in South Africa. And this is her protocol. And um, she shares these widely, so we are able to share these with you if you want. And what I like about this, this protocol, firstly, is that she has different recipes for children and adults. It's mostly done with oral medication, so ketamine and midazolam mixed with panado syrup, and then doses for children and adults. And then if that's insufficient to continue with the dressing, they have a second dose, and this is given intramuscularly in the ward. Um, and then she's got rules that go with these dressing changes, um, such as the patient should be fasted for two hours before. Um, and remember that if the first dose was inadequate today, the next time it's less, it's, it's definitely going to be inadequate again as people develop some uh, resistance to ketamine. They get a tachyphylaxis. So just as a take home message with ketamine, one of the things we've noticed is that we seem to think we'll just do it with ketamine means that you don't have to sit up well. Put monitors on the patient. You'll be surprised. Many of them do have a brief period of apnea. It's worth knowing what's going on. So this is sedation or deep sedation or anesthesia. We should try to put monitors on and we should try to prep our patients if we can. Try to get them fasted. Remember that titration is key in all sedation. So go low, low dose. Go slow, give it time to work, and keep it simple. Don't start adding multiple agents. Just go low-dose ketamine and repeat as necessary. And finally, remember that you can ask for help. Uh, look for on-site hands. When you're doing deep sedation, have two people there. Have someone watching the patient and doing the sedation and the other person doing the procedure. And remember that off-site advice is almost always available, whether you phone me or you phone the anesthetists at the nearest center, you can often get advice about ways to do this better, and especially when you've got time to avoid yourself getting into a difficult situation. Thanks very much.